All right, welcome back to the Down to Get Weird podcast. It has been about uh, a year or two years since my last podcast, but I can assure you this one is uh, better than most of the others. So my guest today is Kevin Kennedy, and we have an interesting story on how we met, and this guy has his own very interesting story that hopefully we're going to get into, but uh, my guest, Kevin... Thanks for being on at your house. Oh, well, thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, we are, uh, we're doing this at your place, so. Yeah, Thanks North Platte, Nebraska. Host. Thanks for coming out to Western Nebraska. Oh, dude, Western Nebraska is gorgeous. I it love is. it. Been out here quite a few times filming, and like, I didn't even know the, the property you guys have is just stunning out here. I didn't know North Platte had this. Yeah, I, th- I don't think people realize, like, in Nebraska, the diversity that exists, and they think it's just flat and corn. And yeah, there's so much else. And as soon here. as you get off, like they have, obviously you have like your main areas that people go, but there's so many more spots I've discovered just by shooting out, shooting other locations for like work that I'm like, oh, I didn't know this was here. Mm-hmm. Like, Dismal River, just north of here. That's insane. Yeah, I have never been gorgeous. Up there, oh my gosh, it's Did you go so to the golf nice. course up there. Yeah, I was shooting oh. the golf course up there, and and then down here, I was like, oh, this looks like. Like an old Western where people would hide out. We were talking about that earlier yeah. today. So there's been, we've, I've been here for a few days and we've had quite a few conversations where like, we need to save this we for like, the oh, podcast. We need to talk about this later. Yeah. Now I know why people say that you, when you're going to do a podcast, don't talk to them in advance because we've had so many conversations, but yeah. I think that's because we have so many things to talk about. Oh too. yeah. Like the first time we came back. Okay. So let's just get into how we met. Yeah. Which is a super interesting story, I guess, or it's kind of crazy. Um, in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka and Colombo. In right? Colombo. And I came downstairs, and there's two guys sitting at the table. One's wearing a, a kimono. <laughs> that would have been me. Uh, was that you? That was, was me. My, oh, yeah. You were yeah. wearing a kimono. and uh, Or maybe you were both wearing a kimono. No, well, Lino, Lino wasn't there. So it was just me. So here's what happened. So Lena and this other guy, Jake, that we were traveling with were, they like stayed in Marissa, mm-hmm. Marissa, like the surf area yeah. or whatever for like an extra day. And I was just working on this video from Malaysia and I was like, I have to like have better Wi-Fi. I have to have a place that the power kept going out. So the wi- so the Wi-Fi would go out, but then the air conditioner would go out. And I'm like, guys, I just, I need to go to Colombo and have like a place where I know I can work like all day. And so we went to the hostel and we were like you, I think, I don't know. I was in a kimono, but I was, no, I came downstairs and, and Matt and you were both there already. So maybe we didn't meet the first day. Maybe we met when Matt was was there. I think I saw you guys the first day, but we didn't didn't talk. And then I heard you guys make a comment about Lincoln, Nebraska. And I was like, what do you guys know about Lincoln, Nebraska? Like we're, what do you, we're we're from there. What do you know about it? It's like, yeah, I'm from Western Nebraska. Yeah, North Platte. And it's really weird when you're traveling to meet someone else from Nebraska. It just doesn't Yeah, happen. I mean, it's weird if you do it in London or Paris or Madrid or, you know, Dublin or something where there's tons of Americans. But in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Yeah, we knew we were kindred like, spirits. <laughs> what are you doing here? Like, yeah. I didn't know there was anyone from the state in, within three countries of this yeah. spot. But dude, yeah, so we met there and then you were playing a show in Lincoln and I came up, saw you and then just through that, like, I mean, as you hope you'll find out what we're kind of talking about today is we're both into a lot of the same stuff. Mm-hmm. So tell us about your project on seven. Um, just, yeah. How did this whole thing come about? Like, give us the so pitch. So when, when we met i had just come off doing a long tour with two other guys we had created this company where we were working with different chinese companies and doing marketing for them but specifically like guitar companies instrument companies uh, amplifier companies and we came up with this idea that we would take their products all over the world and we would shoot local artists in different countries and we could give a local artist a free music video and we could turn around and give the Chinese a marketing video for the company. And so we had been, I believe when, when that 
happened, I had done 26 countries at that point um, and, and filmed so many great artists all over Europe. And I needed a break. So I went to Sri Lanka and kind of just spent a few weeks surfing and um, figuring out what the next move was. Because all the guys in the company we created kind of all wanted to go different ways. And while we were doing that project, while we were filming and um, meeting other artists and, and, and learning how to edit and learning how to do more music production, I decided that wouldn't this be cool to be have have this as a television show like teach people how you could travel and teach them you know how to contact other uh, people who might be in their uh, field I mean specifically for us it was other artists uh, or musicians and so I thought I just thought that would be cool to be a a television show you know here here are these guys traveling that they met companies in China and then use those connections and leverage them to get to travel and go other places in the world while while teaching themselves how to video and teaching themselves how to edit and and record and do all this and in the back of my mind I always wanted to go to every continent and I love songwriting so those kind of those two things kind of came together and I was like man we would be even one one up from that would be to do my own music on every continent. And so On 7 was born and I decided, okay, I'm going to go to every continent and I'm going to write a song on every continent. And I wanted to show the culture in every place. I wanted to show the geography, the landscapes, the people, and really make it feel like a, like a backpacker, a backpacking travel show. You know, you see a lot of shows on... Uh, Netflix or on on Travel Channel and these people are traveling and if you do a little research you find that they'd been there for a couple weeks they picked everything that they wanted to do and and they're great things have been booked ahead of time and things have been booked ahead of time prepped on everything was arranged beforehand yeah and, and it seems spontaneous but a lot of that isn't spontaneous but when we created this show we're like okay we're going to we're going to Buenos Aires well, who do you know down there? Well, I have one friend who knows somebody who's telling me to come to an open mic, and we just went. So every place we went to, it was spontaneous. Um, we were meeting people on the spot, and I think that you can really feel that through the project. And at the same time, I don't feel like the the quality is suffering because of that. Yeah, dude, that is so... Yeah, you were telling me about this, and then... So I kind of have my own idea of something that I want to do on pretty much every continent. And so we were talking about this and I had so many questions and you're so much further along in the process than me. And, you know, we got talking about like the business side and like what has been the, like what was the first step to take for you? Like what was the, okay, I have this idea. Now, now what? Well, I think the really hard part for me was I had the idea, but I knew how much work it was to do what we had already shot. I knew traveling, videoing, editing, recording, all of those things are extremely time consuming and you need a team. And I had worked with two other guys and we all had our own roles and so we were able to do that. Once I had the idea, I was thinking, well, I I can't do this unless there's other people supporting me through this project. Um, I told my friend David, um, I was like, hey, I got this idea. And he's like, dude, I, I, I love it. I'll drop out of college and I'll come with you and I'll be your manager. And so him jumping on board was like, okay, well, now I have someone to take half the load. All right, what, what, what's the next step? So from there, started to look for videographers. Okay, I've made friends who are videographers around the world. Who would be the perfect videographer? And we we settled on uh, Nico. Uh, Nico and Vargas. Where he's from? Huh? Nico Vargas is from Colombia. Okay. So now I have a German manager, David Mas, and then Nico Vargas and he was a videographer. And we decided, okay, we're 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 gonna meet Nico in Argentina. And uh, the first episode, which was in the U.S., we actually had 
some local guys that we just hired for the day to shoot it. Um, but basically, yeah, the, the starting point was just getting people who were supportive by, of the idea and willing to invest their time to to create this project. Nice. So then how soon from like, okay, you're in Sri Lanka is when you came up with the idea? I, I don't really remember exactly where the idea is. I just know, I, I knew, number one, I always wanted to go to every continent in the world. Number two, I loved writing songs in every place that I was going. And so I, it kind of... I think it was really born through filming all these other people places that I was like, man, I kind of want to, I kind of want to be on the camera. Yeah. I don't want to be telling this story. You know? Yeah. 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 Dude, that's like, I'm, we have very similar in, in some ways visions of how it would want to go. Um, what is like, so were, did you fly these guys to Argentina or to LA first? Right. And then, so, and then did you want to, did you try to kind of plan it? in a full go and like how much planning was there and how much was just kind of fly by the seat of your pants? A lot of it was fly by the seat of the, of the pants. <laughs> yeah. Um, David met me in Los Angeles. So we, we decided, okay, LA is the place to meet. Let's go there. Um, I can't remember if Nico couldn't get into the U S um, or it didn't make sense to have him fly from Germany to Los Angeles. So, we had other friends who knew somebody who was willing to to shoot the episode. Um, so we, we were like, okay, LA, it, that makes sense. If he flies from Germany and we fly from the US, we can begin the trip in Argentina. So it just made sense from an economical standpoint. I mean, a lot of decisions were driven by how can we do this the most economical way possible. And then like, okay, so you're on the ground there and it's like you want to write a song. Mm -hmm. You want to... Um, like what else was the vision for like besides writing the song like what else just kind of see the area was it well you know from from <laughs> backpacking I mean when you drive into a new town or you fly into a new city you you just feel this energy and you're like w what's gonna happen next but I don't usually have a plan I kind of just land and I say okay let's go to this restaurant or this bar or this site and see what happens. Or, or like we were talking about earlier, going on a free walking tour. But in this sense, I knew that there was a point to the travel. Like I have to write a song. So how am I going to write a song? I need to, I need to immerse myself with other musicians in the area. I need to learn about the, the history of the music of this area. I need to go, if there is a famous site or a famous studio, I should, I, I should go there. Um, if there, if there was a studio, can I record there? Is there openings? Can I, can I go and, and use the equipment? Um, so it was very driven by the music, but I didn't feel like I was sacrificing the cultural aspects or making friends. So it was, I, I mean, I made so many amazing friends on the trip and I'm excited to share the, the series for the sake of a lot of these amazing artists that, that need to be shown to the world I feel. and so you're making the song with another artist in in, in most places in, pretty much. in most places well you go to antarctica, antarctica is a little difficult not there's a not of, a lot of people there. scientists there maybe yeah. <laughs> yeah and that's probably a whole nother we were briefly speaking about it but like the you're on a ship and just the car the seasickness potentially oh, yeah. and like there's so many other things that go into it outside of you didn't have the thing planned you you know that's like a whole nother aspect of just trying to figure it out i guess so what is like funding this has to be like a obviously a huge thing oh yeah obviously that's the, probably the biggest hurdle for anyone wanting to do something like this that's where i'm at and the scheme of things is i know exactly what it is where where what everything i want to do it's just the funding is where it's hard to get did you have to like, how, like, what was that process like? Was it, you probably got to get creative and do. I dumped my life savings into oh. the project. I maxed out credit cards. I got some small loans, like anything and everything mm -hmm. to complete it. And, you know, this has been a, a three year process still. It's like not complete and I need more funds. It's like everything I do goes right into it. Because I, I'm, I'm so invested at this point, I can't, 
I can't turn back. Yeah. And also I don't want to turn back, but it's like everything I do is, is driven. Um, everything I do work wise is driven to get the money to, to, to uh, complete this. the task. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, that's always the hardest part, securing the funds and, and, you know, I, one of, one of the big things that we wanted to talk about on this podcast and you had ideas as well for me um, is just what's the best way about going about that at this point in time? Do I need to finish the whole project before I can secure more funds? Do I need to give people teasers? Do they need to see the episodes, a episode? Um, do I, do you make it donation based that people can can help you to finish it? Like crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. And- which I don't know feels kind of dead to me. Without giving like giving them something, like mm-hmm. it feels better when you like a crowdsourcing, which I've never done one, but if you can give them something, but it's kind of hard to give them something when you're doing it this way. You're not like you you know, if you want to give them a shirt, then you got to make a bunch of shirts and pay for that. And, exactly. You know, however that is, it's just a yeah. Because we were talking about this a while ago, like the different ways to make money or to offset costs in so many ways. Um, is there anything if you had to like go back and do this again that you'd be like, Oh, I wish we could have, you know, I wish I would have thought about this beforehand. And I know you're not done with it, but just, you know, it's been a few years, Mm. right. You know, like have you, is there anything you're like, man, I really wish, you know, I could have, I would have explored this Avenue first before leaving or, I think that I would have edited more of my own stuff, like got on a routine. So my editing was tight because in the beginning I thought other people are going to edit these episodes. I didn't realize how involved I would be in the actual editing process. And also the also the story design behind it. You know, people think when you're watching reality or you're watching travel documentaries that, um, it, it, it's kind of just flowing. Oh, we went here, then we went here, then we did this, we went this. I mean, there's a lot of thought that like, why does this make sense? How is this congruent? How are these ideas coming together? Um, so I think in the practical sense, if I had maybe been a little bit tighter with my editing and a little bit tighter on the storytelling, that I could have been done with the episodes at this point, that it, it wouldn't have been such a drag. Um and there's no substitute for doing things yourself, you know. When everything start, well, you know, everything's not complete still. Even the travel's not complete for reasons of COVID. But, you know, if if that had been a little bit more clear, I think that it, the editing could have been faster. Um, and the product could be closer to being done. Now I feel really good about how I edit and how I tell stories. So it's making a lot more sense, everything coming together. Yeah. The the editing, being tighter in your craft, you know, I don't think there's any substitute for, for being, for upping your skills before you do something like this. Um, I am happy that I just went and did it because if I had thought about it too much and said, uh, you know, this might be, you know, I'm going to be maxing out cards and I'm going to be worried about the money. I mean, COVID was right around the corner. It stopped us halfway through. And I can't imagine if I hadn't have done it. And then now I was saying, hey, I got this idea. I should go do it, which, yeah, I could totally go do it now. But the world, you know, is a different place. Yeah, it's a tra- I mean, and for so long, like you had these countries picked out. Some of them are just now opening up. I guess, so we were filming some stuff today and yesterday and you were, you know, your idea of like, oh, I'm this brand that I've been using, we won't name the brand, but, you know, reach out to them. And is that something that you did the whole time or you did beforehand or did you think about that before you went on the thing? Like, okay, maybe I'll be using this brand for this thing and reach out to them if there's going to be money or if in the beginning we really were companies. thinking about that uh, we were thinking about that we we were hoping we could get the whole trip paid for from from brands because that's what we had done with the companies in china that they covered everything 
Um, when we reached back out to them, they didn't really get the idea. They were like, oh, I don't know about that. Um, there were a few companies that, that came on board and supported us. But now I think about that with everything that I'm doing because they're, you know, so everything you're using and everything that's visual in a shot is an opportunity for a brand to get exposure and for you to be an influencer, you to, um, you know, rep that brand. So I think about that now. That's another avenue of um, finishing the show and, and getting money to bring it to completion by showcasing in a specific item and brands say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll support you with that. We'll give it to you for free or we'll pay you to use it. So there's a lot of opportunity there right now. But it's hard because you're, you can either take a shot where a logo is very present. You could talk about the guitar or the boat or the chainsaw or whatever it may be. Or your dialogue has to be completely different. So it's kind of hard because you reach out to companies and they're like, oh, well, maybe we'll do that. And you're like, no, but kind of need to know now. Like, we are doing this. If you want to support us, you can. And if not, okay. And you could like do like, okay, we're going to do one take where I talk about it and one take where I don't. Right. And then it's like, if you want it, we can throw that one take in. If you don't, then we're going to use the other take well, that doesn't mention your company and mm -hmm. even maybe blur out your logo. Mm -hmm. just so you don't get that free pub. So you were doing it in China. I haven't heard too much about this part. So break that down. Like how did that process go of finding these Chinese companies or how, the one company I don't there, really know? So I saw this Vice documentary and it I believe it was called The White Man in China. And it was about all these people moving from the States to China to get random jobs as like butlers or to sit in offices and act like businessmen, but they weren't. And, and they were, the Chinese were paying them there. And I was thinking that's a great place for a musician to go. Cause if they're willing to put some random guy in their office, just because he's a foreigner, then they probably will be willing to come see new music from yeah. a foreigner. Yeah. And so when I did that, I would play and I would get approached by brands saying, hey, do you want to use our guitar? Do you want to use our microphone? You can have it. Let's, can we just take a picture of you? And so they were reaching out to you. They would be like there at the shows. And I had like a contact who was in the music industry um, from the, the parts side, you know, from the, um, from the product side. And he, he hooked me up with a couple people and they just wanted me to play their equipment. But when I talked to a friend, well, I made, met a guy there who ended up playing guitar with me and, and we kind of came up with this idea, hey, we should approach these companies, see if they would give us more stuff and maybe we can make videos of us playing them. And then another guy got involved and we decided, well, what if we took this all over the world and we can leave China and travel and use this equipment help other artists around the world and get paid to do it. It's like a dream come true. Like everything yeah. I wanted to do, play music, travel the world and, and travel in, 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 in the backpacker kind of style, yeah. learning about the culture, you know, I think that's something like I've thought about a backpacker documentary for a long time. And I just, it had the idea hasn't like made total sense to me, like what exactly story I'd be telling, but that's something that hasn't, really been told at least from what i've seen i haven't seen anything that like tells the whole i don't know if you want to call it culture of backpacking but in the culture of backpacking in europe is different than the culture of backpacking in asia which mm -hmm. is different than the culture of backpacking in central and south america and they're all way different um that's just another idea i thought yeah, of, i think but, sometimes people like imagine like the beach or something yeah you know the you've seen that movie Oh yeah, you know, the beach. Yeah, in like Thailand. that's what they think backpacking yeah. is. That's like really weird or yeah. or something. Like they don't know that there's like there really is this whole culture of traveling that it's such a unique and interesting thing that unless you've done it unless you've done it for like a little bit, you don't fully get it. Cause like I remember my first probably month or even maybe 
two like month and a half traveling like that I didn't get it and it was still all new to me and and you slowly like assimilate into it but okay let's go back to this Chinese thing so you told me a story about it was one of those guys the guy who got stopped when he was trying to leave China because of the surveillance system that they have and he was like playing gigs oh no 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 that's some that's just some drummer there oh okay yeah Never mind. I heard no, that, that one, but I was like, "No, no, no! I didn't work with that guy. I mean, that guy drummed with me sometimes." Okay, but, but that's a, that's pretty crazy. Um, I don't know if you want. If you want to I, I, get I don't know if I, I don't know if I should tell that. Okay, story. don't you don't tell that just story. just for his yeah, just for his gotcha. sake, you know. Okay, that will be an off yeah, yeah. camera <laughs> story to be told again. But uh, I don't know if he wants to go back to China and they'll like yeah look through my friends or something. To see oh, who that is gotcha. Or, Okay. I mean, I don't know that makes that sense. Is. No, it makes sense. <laughs> we'll move on. We'll move on. Um, okay, so then that was 2019 around then that you, when did you leave for this trip? And like, when did it, from the idea. For, you, for On 7. For On 7. So the, by the so, way, the, the film is called On 7 and it's very close to being done. I've seen parts of it and it's insane. Just so when the right, when the time is right, I'll promote it as well. But um so it's a seven part series. Each episode is about 40 minutes long. Each episode has a, a complete, a, a lot of the episodes have multiple songs, but every episode has a specific song that describes that continent. And then there's a music video that corresponds with that song. I, the question was, when did it start though? It was like 2019. We came up, like the idea was coming into fruition and then we took off January like 10th, something like this, 2020. Okay. And then... And just for context, like we got to Los Angeles around that time. And I remember one person making like a comment about someone being uh, like that there was some sickness that they didn't know what it was. But like it was just like In a China. little yeah. little rumbling of of COVID. You In know? January. Just like, in January. Yeah, I remember Yeah, that. I think someone made a comment about it, but we didn't even think about that, you know? Yeah. And so then, do you want to tell them all the places you're pl- you're going or you went? We did North America, which was the United States we went to. Then we went to Argentina for South America, Antarctica, Laos for Asia, Ethiopia for Africa, Serbia for Europe. And then Australia, I'll be going on Monday, Tuesday, next week. Nice. Yeah, the last one. I wish I could have gone with you. But yeah, you're welcome. They, I know. You're welcome. I, I know. <laughs> I, I got. I should be home for a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna be gone for a little while after this. But, um, do you want to? I mean, it's. I know you have the stories still yet to be told, and is there? I guess, like, do you want to kind of, what were, like, some of the biggest logistical issues? And maybe that's stuff that's in the show that, I don't know if you want to give it away. I don't know if it matters, if it doesn't. But obviously, you're going to have issues with that. How long would you spend in each place, I guess? And then, because you're it, saying we were, we that were the trying, rumblings We were of, trying to do seven continents in seven, con- write seven songs on seven continents in seven weeks. Okay. And then a lot of logistical issues popped up in places that it just was not physically possible to do that. And where, I mean... But mostly in Antarctica, just because we had to deal with time schedules of ships leaving and coming back. And then dealing, same thing with Africa, you know, things don't work on the same schedule that it works yeah. in the United States. And... So those problems arose. Um, logistics always came down to time. And prior, when when I would travel before, that you know, you, you travel like you know that you're going to lose a day here, you're going to lose a day there, or lose multiple days. It's part of the adventure. Sometimes you meet amazing people because you missed the boat, mm-hmm. or or you got stuck somewhere. So I never, I, I couldn't. I did. I couldn't control that, so I let it happen and enjoyed the ride. Really. And did your crew have to like? I got to be home by April tenth or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, or I guess. Yes, that I believe the. March. I I I think Nico did have to be home at a certain time, but 
he was in with us on the project. Mm-hmm. Really, the issue came when COVID got so bad that we had to um, come home. Okay, so you'll see it in the film when it or in the documentary. What a film documentary? The Do- documentary series. Okay, doc docu series. Docu series. Um, you'll see it in great detail then. But like, you're hearing rumblings in L.A. and so you're still going Argentina, and then I would assume you go Argentina. Yeah, but it wasn't to- it wasn't that serious yet. It wasn't yeah. until like later on. Like I don't know how much to give away because some of this is, gotcha. um, you know, aspects of the show yeah. that I want people to like find out about along the way. But um, it definitely caused logistical issues because COVID was happening. Yeah, and the severity that that the world was treating it or not treating it, depending on where you were, what country it was, and then from our personal perspective of you know traveling to places through the years and knowing that places are dangerous, knowing that there are diseases places from, you know, yellow fever to, to AIDS in Africa. Like you, you're, when you travel, you're aware that you go places where there are diseases that exist and there's risks that you're taking being in that location. So this didn't seem like anything strange to us. And I could never imagine at that point that the world would be shut down. What was about to come. Yeah, what was about to come. It's almost like going through it, you can't imagine what it is you're going through. And it's almost like a why now, why me? Like, especially for you, this biggest project of your life. And it's like, really? I've been here for how many years? And this is the... This is the time period where this has to happen. It couldn't have happened. I remember being upset. I was like, why can't I be like 48 when this happened? <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> you know, why do yeah. I? I was 20. I was 30. Yeah. And I'm like, why now? Like yeah. I had a whole trip planned March 27th, 2020 oh. to leave for like probably for like four forever. months, come home for two months and then leave for eight, nine months, mm-hmm. something like that. And then, you know, everything All this is, happened. It's just like a weird, I mean, I'm sure you had that like, really now? Like, this is crazy. I just need. Yeah. And, and when, when it was happening, we finally had to come home. I was thinking, I'll just stay where I am. I'll just stay put. I'll ride it out. Do you, do you want to get into that at all? I don't know if that's a part of the film that you don't like when it hits you have to go home. Or do you, did you, do you go home? Like you, I mean, if you don't want to talk came, about that. We came home cause there was no, there was no, you, you, we had to leave. We had oh, to you leave. did. You couldn't stay. Do you care about saying where, eh, don't, you don't have to say when, where you were. Oh, we happened. were in Ethiopia. Oh, you, okay. And, uh, yeah, that's my, let's just say we place. stuck out like we were foreigners. Cause you are. We are. <laughs> and foreigners can travel. So how would a disease from mm. somewhere that get wasn't there. there get there. It would only be able to come from yep. people coming in. Yep. And it was clear that the foreigners were not from there. So on our last day, I mean, it, it got pretty sketchy. People were saying stuff like surrounding the taxi. Um, so this is... People were saying stuff in the street. We had to keep being like, no, 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 we've been here for two weeks. We've been here for two weeks. <laughs> Jeez, that would be yeah. Which we had, which we had at that point. Like I said, like a logistics. Like, I'm issue. a missionary kid. I lived here my whole life. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I just like, no, we've been here two weeks. I live, and here, we were guys. with some local guys, and they're like, no, 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 don't worry about them. They've been here for two weeks. I kept saying that because at that point they were like, it's two weeks, you know. Yeah, two weeks slow spread. Yeah, I think we're yeah. still. I don't know, but we were trying to leave, and we're trying to go to Australia, and we went to the. We had to go to the office because the internet. The, the, the actual, you couldn't buy the tickets online at that point. Like the, mm-hmm. it was, it wasn't letting you, like Kiwi buy wasn't them. letting you buy the ticket. Oh. And so we went to the airport and we were, the lady's like, okay, so you'll go from Cape Town to, I think we're going to go, we we're going to go to Perth or Sydney. And she's like, all right, you fly through Cape Town. Uh, oh, they just canceled it. Like we were standing there and she's like, Australia would still take you, but Cape Town says no transit for foreigners. So you could fly to South Africa if you were South African. You could leave South Africa if you weren't South African, but you could not stop in yeah. Cape Town Airport and transfer. 
So we could, I could only come back to the States and David was German. They were letting Germans into the States. Like at that time, hmm. the U S was letting anyone still come in. Yeah. We were one of the last ones to shut. Yeah. But like Germany at that time, I don't think would let me in. Wait, were we one of the last ones to shut? Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't now we're like la- one of the last ones to open, right? They're still not. Is it still open? Is it not open? I mean, I think you got to be vaxxed. Well, when I was... Country. You can't like... They're not so just So they like have open borders. before. It didn't matter. And I think you still need to test, right? Up until in. recently, it didn't matter if you were vaxxed or not. You still couldn't come in the US. Only citizens could come in. No, At I feel th- th- it's still like that. I'm pretty see, sure. See, but th- there were a lot of Irish on my flight from Ireland uh-huh. a few weeks ago. There were... Did you need a test when you came back from Ireland? No, I Ireland? never need... No. Oh. Did you need it? I didn't even look. Oh. I didn't even I look to see still, if you had it. I didn't need it. I bet you still needed one. But I you didn't, did they not. Probably just they didn't check anyone. They're just not doing what they should be doing. Oh, that's. I did not even think of that. I mean, I was living in Mexico and Colombia, or I was traveling there and living there throughout COVID, and I always had to have it. Yeah. And, well, almost always. At the start, when I was living in Mexico, I didn't have to have it. But, yeah, I didn't even think about that coming in. I wonder if you still needed it. That would have been interesting if I would have got to the airport and been... I mean, I came from Scotland on a but separate they, flight from they Dublin. They never so. asked you at the airport. They yeah. didn't ask No, they ask when you it, when you're checking in. When, to get on the flight. So it's like when, when they're checking check in, in. So they're checking in other countries, but the U.S. actually isn't Always. checking. They're checking in the other countries. They check and they're And they're coming. relying on the airlines to do that. TSA yeah, that's or the border, con- patrol, border control in the U.S. is not looking at that. No, no, no. It's the airlines to get on the plane. Right. So, yeah, they're saying, like, you're responsible for checking, but you can't even give them a ticket. You can't issue them a if ticket they, before. You don't see They've it. obviously dropped but it you didn't because need I didn't that have for to. Ireland. Okay. Didn't need okay. it. Then didn't need it to changed. get into Ireland, but didn't need it to come home, which is the first okay. time, which d- did not come to my mind until right now, which would have been bad if you did need it. Yeah. You wouldn't have had it. Or well, they would have made you go. But luckily, I had like- friends. I had friends who went home before me, so they would have said something. Hmm. Um, yeah, well, you don't need a test to get in anymore. Mm -hmm. So I guess it, it pretty much seems like everything's over. I know like, but I I still think for foreigners, they can't come in if they're, you have to be vaccinated, right? Really? To come. I I think that's the way in Canada too, potentially. We would have to check on that actually for the U S I don't know, but that's what I believe. That's what I believed for a long time. Have you ever used Sherpa maps where you can like. See uh, the world and what's open, what's not open. I've, I've their... done it on Skyscanner. Okay. And they have it, but it's not always Accurate. correct. Yeah. It's pretty close, but it's not. And now it's almost useless. Everything is open, it seems like. Um, hmm. So after Antarctica, this is just the geograph- geographical mind I have. Did you go to Laos? How yes. did you get out of... Antarctica. So you went you back. You got to come back to Argentina. Yeah, back to Argentina and then to Laos. Yeah. Where does that flight leave from? Leave from? Does it I leave from we Buenos were, Aires? We, we flew from like Ushuaia to Buenos Aires to. I think we even had to stay in Buenos Aires a night, and then went to Brazil, and then Brazil maybe to Doha. Really? They go Rio to Doha. I think it was crazy, man. I, I was, I mean, you you have to watch the episode yeah. because we're I'm explaining it and I'm not even sure. Like, yeah. you know, I was like, I'm up for yeah, I'm just plus in 38 planes. hours, 48 hours. I forget what it was. And that like put such a toll on your body that yeah. like compressed air, just the, yeah. everything. Um, yeah, dude, that is the worst part of travel by far. But okay, I just love to know, like, I like to find out the routes and like where it's cheap. And where places fly from, so then I can piece it together in my head. Like, oh, if I'm gonna what, if I'm gonna go to this part of the world, I might as well. I'm gonna be close enough to here, so I might as well just stop there for yeah. a week. And yeah, then, we. I, I'm pretty sure we went to Doha, and then we went there. Then that's we went a to lo- seems Antien. like a long flight. It was a really long flight. Yeah, that is maybe one of the longest I've taken. And then, so wait, after Doha to Vientiane. oh yeah yeah Vientiane, and then Serbia. Ethiopia. Well, Serbia was like during COVID time. We they they like didn't really shut down. Oh yeah. You could go. 
They were pretty open. Montenegro almost never shut down. Montenegro never shut down. I think Serbia did shut down, and that was... Turkey after, never after. shut down. But, uh, do we, Serbia like waited a whole year, I'm pretty sure. I think and Turkey then, like, is the only country in the world that never shut down. And Mexico. Mexico? They did shut down. They shut down until July. Costa Rica? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. El Salvador? I think everything but Mexico. Okay. Until like July. So, I mean, it was okay. March. At the end of March, so then April, May, and maybe June. Maybe they opened in June. Soft opened in June. Mm. In 2020? 2020. Because oh, I went there July 2020. So I think they opened June 1st. But Turkey was open. I was thinking, I'm just going to go stay in Istanbul for a while. Mm. But then you can't really go. I mean, you can go around Turkey, but... Yeah, how do you get there? There's direct flights, but you would have to be on a direct flight. And I think the prices were crazy expensive because if you wanted to go anywhere, you're going to Turk. You have to go to Turkey. Oh, so that's where For I'm like two months, the only place you could go is Turkey. Unless you no, want to... um, you know where it never closed down? Wasn't it Sweden? Sweden never closed either. I remember reading that the other day, which surprised me. I don't think they had quarantines of any sort. Oh, I don't think they okay. had any restrictions. Oh, but they weren't letting people I don't in. think they were letting people oh, okay. in. And that might have been a Shenzhen thing. Okay. I, I When you're saying shut down, I'm thinking that, but you're talking about borders. Yeah, borders. Like, you okay. can't get in. Okay. Um, Because, like, Australia, outside of, like, Perth... I believe Western Australia. I don't believe that ever shut down. Mm. Uh, they just locked their borders. No one in, no one out. No one. Australia is pretty strict. That's what about it seemed it. like. I'm surprised but that they're they open. They stayed open in that area, so I don't know. Um, okay, so do you want to talk about what's coming up? So I'm finally going to finish after all these years. I've just been waiting for Australia to open back up, and now it's open. Most of the episodes are completely edited, so I have Australia to finish, and I'm just so excited um, to finally bring everything to to a close, to be like, yeah, I wrote a song on every continent. Look at all the amazing musicians I worked with. Look, look at all these beautiful places, people, culture. I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to share the whole story. You know, I think one of the one of the hard parts about everything that's happened over the last three years, and this isn't specifically about creating the show, but as you know, traveling and I know traveling, you, you you're just I feel like you're very aware of the the functioning of the world. And the systems that are in place and the governments that are in place and the the uh, companies that are in place. And when you travel, you kind of live outside of that for a little bit because you're almost a, a bystander. You're somewhere else that you don't belong. So because you don't belong, you don't completely uh, you don't completely fit in. And even no matter how hard you try. And so I think what was hard on me the last three years was seeing that I didn't feel like I fit in even being home because of the craze that was happening and everything that was taking place and the the worry, the concern, the panic, all these things taking place. And you, I kind of want to just be like, it's going to be okay to mm-hmm. people. Yeah. You know, it's okay. It's going to be, it's going to be fine. And um, I hope that in the the series that comes across as well, you know, that we, you know, people, I, I wondered if they're like, oh, these guys were reckless or traveling around, you know, with this thing going on. Um, at that point, we didn't know all the information. But looking back, I'm like, yeah, th- th- that was all going on. But people were living their lives. You know, people, 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 a lot of places have a lot of things to worry about, not just getting a disease. They have to worry about getting food on their table every day. They have to worry about, um, surviving the neighborhood that they live in and you know it, it's just it's been so wild to me that how crazy the world became so yeah things things were nuts they're starting to slow down which is a you know i think everyone's happy about all that things are going back to normal things seem everything seems under control um 
Australia was one of those tougher places to get into. Like looking into that, like you had to wait for a while to get in. And is do you know if there's any restrictions or anything, any any hurdles that you've had to like think about before going there? Like how much is planned out? So <laughs> it's kind of interesting because I through the process of the trip, I kind of wanted to go to Papua New Guinea instead of uh, Australia. And so technically they're, it's they're, Oceania. They're, they're, Oceania. The, well, that's the continent, right? Yeah. And they're still not open. But Australia is back oh, open. Okay. But it's funny because we made the maps for the show and everything, and Australia was always in there. So it actually is probably how it should be because yeah. Australia was always going to be there. But they're open. I don't know about any restrictions. But things have changed now. You know, it's it's almost three years later. And... You know, I don't know. I, some of the guys that were with me before are not with me anymore. Uh, not in friendship ways, just in, in the business of this, you know, because people had to move forward. Yeah, you know, for sure. and people all over had to get new jobs or, or start new careers and or losing their jobs and are still trying to figure out what to do. So it's going to be a little bit different because I'm going by myself this time. I got my cameras in my bag. I got my guitar and it's funny because I would have thought by the last continent, it would be the most prepared one. And maybe it is from the standpoint of storytelling and what I'm visualizing, but from the aspect of the crew and the size and, and the grandeur of it, mm -hmm. it's going to be a little bit different, but I think that will add to the whole story because it, it really will describe this last three years and what took place. And you're going to see this whole process of us starting out before COVID and ending when COVID's quote unquote over or back to normal, you know, I think that's going to be really interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's a juxtaposition or just seeing the first few episodes and maybe by then people will be getting this groove of like, this is what it is. Now you're going to have this three year gap between the sixth episode and the seventh episode, which would be really interesting to see how things are different, <laughs> you know? So I think that's like a, in some ways it might make the, the film even better because there is this three year hiatus in between episodes where before it was days mm -hmm. and you know, you've grown and, and you've, you know, you have planned more maybe, or you know what to expect with the planning, you have the planning and the expectations. And so I'm, that's, I think going to be a really interesting to check out in between those episodes. Like, how is this different? How is it shot different? How, how's the music different? How is, you know, you're going to look probably different. And I think that's, uh, I think that's going to make it even more unique and something that, that is leading, being led into, mm -hmm. I guess, by the end of the show, when you watch the first few episodes, it's like well, in the last episode, there's going to be a big, yeah, might be, be a big difference. Maybe not. I don't know. I think, I think it will be. I think it will, you know, I, I, I was really bummed about it that I couldn't finish it. But now looking back, maybe the project is more complete and more, it, it dives into more topics. And yeah, just like you said, my music I have become a better musician. I've become a better songwriter over that time. So you're going to be able to compare episode one to episode seven, and you're really going to see this gap within the same project, mm -hmm. which may be different than like, Hey, seven weeks later. Okay. Finished. Cool. That's everything you saw. Well, now it's seven weeks. I mean, not seven weeks later, it's three years later by the time you see this, but you're going to get all the feels you're going to get from from everything being open to, to the pressure of COVID to people trying to open again. And that's just from the aspect of uh, the world culture, let's call it, because there's so much more that goes into it. Because we, you know, investigate history and we're investigating um, food and investigating lifestyle and dance and, and all to write a song, you know? Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's going to be a, I don't know, I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see it all come together. I haven't even seen one of the full, 
haven't seen you haven't seen a full episode haven't yet. seen a full episode maybe yet. i'll show you one <laughs> i've seen some things yeah i know i gotta i gotta check it out but from what i've seen it's it's so good i want to get into or i just want to know because i don't know and this is something cool like we've been talking and learning more about each other and i'm just like this is, should be on the podcast like I, this is stuff that we should talk about but like how did you get into from north platte nebraska how did you like what was your journey into i guess traveling i mean i don't know if I, it's a very general term but you know that curiosity of how other people live i guess if someone from north platte nebraska you don't you just don't see it that much and so i'm just curious uh, that just made me think of when i was a a sophomore in high school I had to take Spanish class and I remember saying to my Spanish pe- teacher why would I ever need to know this and she said well maybe you want to go to Mexico sometime and I go eh, I think not dude I was the exact same way I, the only class I was ever failing in high school was a Spanish and I was uh-huh. like I hate this I'm never yeah. gonna use it why would you ever I don't need ever it? want to be uh-huh. in a place where I'd have to use it mm-hmm. I remember saying that yeah I did the exact the, same, dude, thing. The same so thing so ornery and and then I went to college, still didn't want to do that. And then there was a summer program and a friend's like, I'm going to the summer program in Prague for six weeks. And I was thinking, oh man, but I'd have to give up my summer to go to Prague. Like, why would I want to go to Europe to go like study? Why would I want to go study in the summer? I'd rather just Everyone there has work and hang pits. out, you know? And and then I went and it was just like the switch was flipped like I didn't want to go home you know and when I got back I I, I I applied for another study abroad in Australia and then after I got back from Australia I was like okay what am I going to do after I graduate like now's the time to start looking for jobs and I still had one Spanish class to finish and so I had to stay for the summer after I graduated like they told me I was graduated as long as I finished this last course in Spanish yeah. and so I did that and I you know, I stayed and worked the whole summer in Williamsburg in Virginia. And when that when that class ended, I stayed and worked a few more months. And then I was like, OK, I really just want to travel. And so I bought a one way ticket pretty much to Europe. And after a few months, I ended up in Cape Town, South Africa, got a job there. And I was just like, I'm going to I'm just going to live here. What were you doing there? Just working in a restaurant. Okay. I was like waiting for an internship at a bank and they were like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we'll see if we can process this and get you in. Never came through. And after a few months of being there and working at the restaurant, I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm done here. All right, now I can go to the next place. How was Cape Town? I've never, I mean like... Dude, Cape Town's like my favorite city. In the really? Country. I've heard like South Africa is one of those places that you hear so many bad things about. I've never been to Africa and I'm like, that actually gives me that feeling of like nervousness, which you, I probably, I don't know if I should, but I oh, like, it, I love that feeling. It's raw. I mean, you have to be aware of exactly where you are at what time you're there. You know, you, if you're on the main, if you're on Long Street, when I was there, if it was after dark and you took a right and you went in 30 feet. Ooh. That might be uh <laughs> That'd be bad news. You might be robbed, yeah. It was like very much like you stand here, you're okay. Over there you might not be okay. Huh. Um but it's weird because sometimes when you start talking about Cape Town or South Africa, you, you start saying negative things and I don't want it to be about the negative <laughs> things, but it's such an amazing place and it felt like to me like I was in this in the wild west kind of like I was very aware of my surroundings all the time I was very like present and I loved it um the people I met there were were so kind and and nice and I love surfing so the surfing was great the city itself is beautiful and then there's such a contrast of you know there's there's a lot of hardships in 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 South Africa and it's a tough place and so I just was learning a lot and, and experiencing a lot. How was the, you think of South Africa, you think of surfing, you think of sharks. Was that <laughs> sketchy, dude? Like the sharks to me, that's like a huge fear. There were like my friends there one morning took me surfing and it was like 6 a.m., like still dark. And we were driving in, in Nuduk and we were driving down to the, I think we were driving to Kolmaki to, to surf. 
if you know these spots, if you've been there. But we were like going down there and the water looked almost like black, like it was so dark, like in the morning. And I said the same thing. I was like, don't you guys worry about sharks? And they're like, oh, bro, like 25, 25% chance you'll get bitten. And I was like, 25% chance. And he's like, one, two, three, four. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? And they were dead serious. They're like, yeah, there's sharks all over. But like the more people you're out with, the less chance you have. Yeah. Just get them. Just don't be the furthest one out. Yeah. Dude, that's uh, first off. I love the brew. And then I and then I like a few weeks later, I went by myself because I saw one guy in the water and I was like, okay, fifty percent chance. And I go out and I'm surfing and all of a sudden like (laughs) and I scream, dude. And I just start paddling for the shore as fast as I can. So a shark came out. Something like, jumped in the air. Oh, gotcha. And as I'm paddling toward the shore, another one comes. A dolphin does a flip. Oh. It was a pod of dolphins. And I scream. So the other guy's paddling. And I look over and he's like laughing now because all these dolphins are like flipping next to me. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because if there's dolphins there, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. D- like yeah. Once dolphins are around, dolphins are there's no... Good sign. You're good. Don't Do dolphins, is that a protection thing or they won't be around you if there's a shark? What's the I've f- heard of dolphins protecting. People. That's what I've heard of. Yeah. But I no, but I don't no think idea. if a, a dolphin's around, sharks won't come around because they don't like do- a yeah, pot dolphins. of dolphins will kill a great white. Nice. They just swim around him, hit him until he's dead. You know. Nice. Dolphins are so cool. That's cool. It's like May- Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. Just kind of teeing you up on the outside. Well, he's like he's a defensive guy. Wait, he's he's he like the dolphins or he's well, like he's, the great no, white? No, he would be like a defensive guy who just stands on the outside and just kind of tees off until. Uh huh. Doesn't get hit. Just swimming around. Yeah, the Yeah, maybe that's not a great analogy. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, dude, that. But is then, like, like Jay Bay, like further down the way, that's where you see that like famous video of McFanning getting, um, like the the leash getting bit. And yeah. His board getting pulled down yeah. while he's surfing. Yeah, that was. No, that was a, I mean, that was a good drive away, but you know. Yeah, there's a few waters. things I don't thrills I don't search out. That's one of them. <laughs> That's yeah. one of them. Yeah. Surfing anywhere where there's near sharks. But, um, okay, so you were in South Africa. Then what? Like, then, I don't know much about your back story yeah, I, at all. Yeah, I mean, then I, cool. then I traveled for some more time, and I was planning to, like, teach English in Taiwan. And um, my family, my mom was like, we haven't seen you in a year. And I was like, yeah, I don't know when I'll... Where'd you go after South Africa? India, then to Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then Vietnam to Indonesia. And then I had the ticket to go to Taiwan. And that's when my mom's like, we haven't seen you. So I ended up coming back. And What time of year was that? June. Maybe. Oh, there you go. That's a good June, time. Some, yeah, a good it was time summer. To come summertime home. was kicking time off to here, home. you know. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I think it was around that time. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I I didn't want to. I didn't want to stop. It was awesome, you know. Yeah, and then like, so were you working that whole time as you were going? So many no. people wonder how. No, I this wasn't. Life goes. I, I I I worked in South Africa, and then yeah. I mean, I do the odd job here and there. Mm-hmm. Like India, we were we went and worked on some Bollywood sets. Oh, seriously? Yeah. What were you doing? Um, we were like actors, stand-ins in the background. In some Bollywood actors. movies, we were stand-ins. How did in the that background. happen? Did you find that, or did they find you? I, they 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 found us. I mean, I had read about it, and then. <laughs> and then when were we were there, like, like people were like, "Yeah, if you go here, you can get in it." And and at that time. You could kind of, you would show up and they'd give you X amount of money, like $5 or something. And then if you came back again, they'd give you like 10, like you could work your way up. You, you could have worked your way up probably to be like so a famous Bollywood star. So what were you Bollywood doing? Star. One of the dudes standing in the background. Like You're I think like, I was dancing. Hey. I was like, we were doing like some like small dance. We were like talking in a club. <laughs> have you um, seen the movies? This, like no, 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 no. I don't even know what the movies were oh, called. Oh, dude, you got to get the name <laughs> of the movies. Know. Yeah, I I probably should. If someone finds awesome. any of these movies, I'll yeah, they, I'll send maybe I'm you famous something. in India. I'll send you a hat or something <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, I never saw the movies. Oh man, you got to find out the name of these movies. 
But I, I think too, we like I went looking for it because it was I had read Shantaram, and like I think he does. Does he do that in the book? I don't remember. Did you ever read that no. book? Oh, it's coming out on, on one of the streaming platforms. Okay. Uh, uh, the guy who was in Sons of Anarchy, the main guy, he's like playing that. that oh, okay. Dude. It's a good book, but I think they made a reference to it. I, I forget how I found out about it, but when we we just talked to a guy and he's like, "Come and you got the catered food," you mm-hmm. know, because India was so expensive. Where in India was that? <laughs> uh, it was in Mumbai. Mumbai. Yeah. That's I've never been to India. I need. To, I want, I'm going to go. Probably in December or something. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Maybe so. I want to go. Maybe I'll go do a stand-in on it. Yeah, you can totally do that. I'm sure. And then, <laughs> I, but when, I, I'm going back to, to the job thing, no, there on. wasn't that much. I just you had just saved up before. And yeah, gotcha. Yeah, that is. Uh, and then I just came home with nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Except yeah. all the memories. People don't understand. Like, I'll go to zero. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I can go like find free places to sleep until I can make money. Like until I come home, you know, day one or whatever. But I'll go, actually, I will go to nothing in my bank account to my name. Like, well, and you can travel and go places where you can find jobs. People just equate it to wait a second. I made twenty dollars a day or ten dollars a day. Yeah, it's like yeah, but you're living. In, you know, okay, I got $5 in India. You can eat a really good meal. At that time, we were eating for like $1.50 yeah. a meal. And I think like our hostel where we were staying, it wasn't the Ritz-Carlton. It was, oh, <laughs> it was, it really? was $2 a night. Oh, nice. I think it was the Salvation Army there or I something. found a place in India for 75 cents a night, mm-hmm. which, again, not the Ritz, but cheap. Yeah. Um, okay, so then you come. So home when you when you get five dollars a day, it works out, right? You didn't spend anything that day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you can get free taxi rides there too, as long as you go look at their merchandise. They're like, "Oh, we take you to look at diamonds." Yeah, or pearls, Dude, and then I you're got, like, "I got caught in that scam in Ooh, Bangkok." I could have I could have spent thirty five cents, or <laughs> my buddy at that point was like, "Dude, really? Just like, get me just to like, the place. Just, just let's go." I remember that happened in Bangkok, and they're like. How much is it? Like, well, it's only this if you go to stop at my friend's stores. Uh huh. And like, otherwise, it's this much. And I was like an idiot you do trying that to once be like as twice, cheap as like, possible. Nah. There was a few years there where I was like, the absolute cheapest way possible is what I'm going to do every single time. Mm-hmm. Whether it's like a four dollar difference in like six hours, I'm like, I'm saving that four dollars. I did the same thing. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. That's like the biggest change in my traveling. traveling. It's like, eh, yeah, I'll you just... start to realize like, okay, I'll just pay the extra money. Yeah. But that's the money. funny part too because don't you feel like people like, oh, you must have spent so much money and like lived this lavish life like rolling around. I don't know if people think that, but I sometimes think that when, when, when they're asking questions. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dude, I don't think you could handle where I slept. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I Dude, don't think I, you could handle what I saw. I have in my slept bedroom, in the same you know, room like, as scorpions on the wall mm-hmm. next to me a few times. Like people can't handle like if there's a bug in the room. We were talking about this earlier. If there's a bug in someone's room, like you have to kill it. I can't sleep. Like there's a scorpion and I'm looking at it as I'm going to sleep in this bug net. And if mm-hmm. that thing's not there when I wake up right where gonna, it is, <laughs> I'm going to freak out. Yeah. Like you got to check yeah. your shoes. You just bring all your stuff into the bug net with you. Yeah. And like, oh man, it's, yeah. and we were talking, so when we, a few months ago, when we brought all this up about trying to fund it and I was bringing up crowdsourcing and how that doesn't, like when you're in this travel, at least in like when it, you're doing something like what you're doing, it seems so cool because it is. People are like, why would I give you money? You're already mm-hmm. doing this cool thing. But, you know, we brought that up where it's like, it's hard to crowdsource to go travel around the world. You know, it seems like a, usually it's for like medical bills for people or something, a mission trip or something like that. Yeah. And there was like, uh, I think it was a period in time when you, people were doing Kickstarter and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff to, to, to kick off ideas. And, and it was really exciting. But then 
you know, everyone maybe has a one Kickstarter or, or one crowd cert, uh, funding in their life. And then people are like, I'm not going to do that yeah. again. Um, but yeah, you feel that cause they're like, wait, you're going to go do this awesome thing and I'm just going to give you money. To pay do it. For what you is the, it. what is the benefit to me? And, um, yeah, I think it, it, it it's hard to do it mm-hmm. that way. And also it feels weird, right? Cause we know that traveling is so awesome. Like, and, 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 and how much fun it is. And if you have a really good project idea that helps a bunch of people then it, then it will work. Um, it, it's been hard with the show to want to do it. Maybe it would work. I don't know, but it doesn't feel completely right, right, right now. Yeah. No, it's it, almost like know? there's an imbalance of what you're getting to what you're giving. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to do. I mean, in a lot of reason, in a lot of ways you don't get that. I think coming up with unique ways to like provide people something, whether that's an experience or that's like a, you know, some merchandise of some sort, names on the credits, you know, whatever, like we've, we've seen it all, Mm -hmm. but it's not a bad way if you can become, you know, come up with something unique and creative to like, I've been a part of someone's like charity basketball tournament Mm -hmm. to raise money for, or not charity, just like a basketball tournament to raise money for their mission trip. I'm like, I'll pay $20 to go play it basketball against a bunch of people who also don't know how to play basketball Mm -hmm. and it's funny and it goes to this person's mission trip or something like that like i've done that and that's cool and that stuff like that we can provide an experience i feel better about i would never want to just i'm doing this project could you give me money like i absolutely hate that it's when i was like in youth group stuff like in youth ministry and stuff like that it was they're like do you want to be paid and i'm like what do you mean like you got to fundraise i'm like never I'll never mm-hmm. do that, like ever. Mm-hmm. It's not, I hate it. Like, it makes me squirm just trying to get money from people, but it's, you know, there's so many, it's a thought that comes into when trying to fund something like this. And um, Well, the question that I ask too is like, if I show people an episode and they want to see it, they'll be entertained. So there's a benefit there. If you want to be entertained or you want to learn about this country, you can watch an episode. But then do you put a price on that episode? You say, hey, it's this much. Or is it, hey, here's the episode. What is that worth to you? Because Drew might feel like, hey, I like Kevin's idea. I want to see him finish it. I like the episode. I want to see the episodes. All right, I'll give him $20. Mm -hmm. someone else says I can only give two dollars but I really want to support Kevin I really want to watch this episode Mm -hmm. so we're talking twenty two dollars with two people but if I just put it up online for seven dollars seven dollars and seventy seven cents on seven you know yeah yeah then two people is only sixteen dollars roughly yeah so that's less than what it would be if I gave them the opportunity so the question is is that is it better to let people decide? Yeah. What it's worth to them? Mm-hmm. Value for value? Yeah. And that's, uh, and it comes into a, like, are you going to get the people who you know, who's already just in your, you know, social circle and your, I don't know, your reach? Maybe. Because, like, for seven seventy seven, which isn't that expensive, they can still also buy almost any movie online. To where they're like, well, I also want to buy this. Right. And would thing. those people be willing to give more? Because and they already know me. But then the they're like, well, person. I supported Kevin because I yeah. gave him that number rather than them making up the number. And that's what I'm saying is like the random person might be like, well, it's 777. I could watch this random episode of this person who I don't know, which seems like a cool idea and I want to see it. Or I can pay for a month of this streaming service for the same price. Right. You know, and that you, you've got to play those things in your head. And then it's like, it's 777 for people who are going to support me, for me and this cool idea. But it's mostly for me in the sense of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that's the hard, that's the tricky part of it where you don't, you don't know how to go about it. And we were talking about this. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to do because you, you start thinking about crowdfunding. Then you th- start thinking about that's kind of outside of crowdfunding. Like that's how much you should charge for people to see it. 
or do you charge or do you go to a donation based slightly donations because they're deciding what they're paying mm-hmm. it's not really a donation because they're still viewing the product yeah but they're deciding their price then you could go strictly donation and be like hey give me whatever you want for me to complete this project which is kind of back to the crowdfunding mm-hmm. again and then you have can i find investors does someone want to give money and have their name tied to this mm-hmm. You have to know the right people. Isn't that how a lot of executive producers are? Oh, yeah, man. I, I, you Where it's know, like, you'll be an executive producer on this if you donate, if you invest $40,000. You're an executive it, so producer and you get little credits. Yeah. You get to be on IMDb yeah. or whatever. I mean, that's the hardest part of trying to, you know, the, the other route is selling it. So I'd love to sell it to Netflix yeah. or Hulu or one of the main streaming platforms or even to travel channel or something like that but when you try to find who's in charge of buying or who's in charge of pitching the show to their boss to to say okay we're going to acquire this show and we're going to acquire the licensing for it you don't know who that person is because so many people have executive executive producer Mm -hmm. on their imdb profile yeah so how do you figure out who's the one who just gave the money and has their name attached to it for some clout and who's the one who's actually no, like I am the producer who decides this. And how do you reach, like how do you reach them? These are all the things that I've been really racking my brain over is I'm like, okay, I see the thing. I see like the platforms where I think my idea would be great. Mm -hmm. I'm writing down the names at the, on the credits and I'm looking them up and I'm like, who do I reach out to? Who's the person? And, Unfortunately, like where we live, like in Nebraska, there's just, there's not a lot of leads mm-hmm. of people around. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of like, so the streaming platform, something like that, is that a step you've looked into? How, how far along down the road, if you have? You know, we had a couple of conversations with, with people and and some actually turned into drawing up contracts. Um, but the the points of the contract weren't in our favor. Um, there wasn't safeguards for us to be protected in some of these situations. And that was always very frustrating because it's like, well, do you just trust it? Do you just trust this person you don't know who's an executive producer? Mm-hmm. And maybe they can get you what they're saying, but if you don't have those safeguards within the contract that you're protected, you could end up giving a lot of the show away, a lot of the ownership. And by the time you sell it, you, you're left with a way smaller portion. And these people got pieces for not doing that much work or not doing any work, you know? I mean, one of the one of the situations we were in was... Um, somebody wanted a non-exclusive deal and then on top of the non-exclusive deal, if they didn't sell it, they always got their, I believe it was 10% or their 5%, no matter what. It just didn't make sense. And I, you know, you're always left wondering, well, what if they could have sold it and it would have been sold by now and we could have been finished, you know? But at the same time, it's like, yeah, but those safeguards weren't in place for us. And and in this industry, you don't know if people who are who they say they are. You don't know. There's a lot of sharks in the water. A lot of people will talk a big game, but maybe they can't do it. And the great part for them is they can talk a big game and you sign over a percentage and they say, oh, yeah, I'll sell it to Netflix. And then they come back to you later and say, hey, I couldn't sell it to Netflix, but I know a guy who could. How about you talk to my friend here? or my associate, and he'll be able to sell it. And by the way, I'm still going to get my 10% because I hooked you up with him, and I tried. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that seems sketchy. And that would be a contract with that guy where it's like you can't just, if that happened, you're like you have to that pony it. up and pay. Yeah. Um, but he could have sold it. I, I You know, I'm not, yeah, I'm yeah, not saying sure. that the guy couldn't have done that. It just was felt uncomfartable. Do you think there's like, are there any... I mean, in your research of all this, has there is there like services where you can go? Like, I have this idea. I need an agent. Maybe I need an agent, or I need someone to represent me to try to sell this. Are there 
again, I literally have no idea how any of that you know works. That's, that's been one of the hardest parts because I'm <laughs> I'm the songwriter, I'm the talent on the show, I'm doing the editing, and then I'm trying my best to do the sales of it. I can sell it if you put me in the room with the guy, but how do you go about finding these leads? It's very difficult. You have to use every part of your network. Anybody who says, oh, I know a guy who works in this, like, okay, can you give me his contact? Let me just write him an email. Maybe he'd be interested. Maybe he wouldn't. And I found people who are supportive of the idea and they're like, oh, this is great. I can't do anything for you. But even that of them saying like, this is good and this is a great quality. Um, but I haven't found like a service to go to that that specializes in that where you can can go like like I almost imagine that you have a kind of like a LinkedIn. Yeah. Where it's strictly just in the entertainment industry where you can be like, here's what I have. Who wants it? But there's so many people doing that. Like, I don't know how that would even work, you know? Yeah. And people in the industry want to work with people they know and people they trust. So how do you get into those circles? Do you need to be in those cities in front of them? Like, you know, we, I don't know many people in Nebraska who do what we do. I know you. In the, in the realm of like trying to like documentary making or, you know, your own projects and doing this. I know you mm -hmm. and I had to go to Sri Lanka to meet you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, well, I wouldn't have known you. From, to, yeah, for sure. And so many of the people who I, I, I do know a couple from Nebraska, but they don't live here anymore. They're in New York or L.A. Yeah. And then where is that? Where is it? Is it L.A.? Is it New York? Mm -hmm. Is it Miami? Like, mm -hmm. I have no idea. I don't know. It's 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 frustrating. It's the most frustrating part of this whole job because you can be amazing at your craft. There are amazing musicians out there and amazing filmmakers and editors, but they don't know the right people. And so, and I've heard of you know I I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of comedians, and they're from what it sounds like in the comedic, you know, crew. Or in the, what is that? The, I, I'm comedic not coming world. With the, word. the comedic world, whatever it is. They're like, you have to live in L.A. or in New York. You have mm. to be there. Like, that's where it is. It's L.A., it's New York. And maybe that's starting to change. But, and you know, you got to be in a big city at least. You got to mm. be in Chicago. You got to be in, I don't know, like Miami, something like that. You got to be somewhere big. And that you can't do this in a small, small area, mm -hmm. small town or a small state or... You, you got to be where the action is, where the people are. And I just wonder if that's the same thing. And it probably is. But Maybe. I don't want to live in L.A. <laughs> I don't want to live in L.A. either. I don't want to live in New York either. It's yeah, like, I don't want to live there either. It, it's a hard thing because you don't want to sacrifice your lifestyle for and just giving in and saying, okay, I have to go do that. And maybe maybe you do have to go do it for a time period just to meet the right people. But then at the same time, like, how do you know that the executive for this or that company isn't going to be who knows stopping for coffee in North Platte, Nebraska. And you happen to walk into Starbucks and he's yeah. working on a project in Denver and he had to drive. I mean, life is serendipitous, right? Yeah, you sure. don't know who you're supposed to meet. Why? If I didn't meet you in Sri Lanka, we wouldn't be talking right now. For sure. And we have no idea that the, like what happens in three months from here, you know? Yeah. I just think I know where it's not happening. And that is just, it hasn't been happening at home. Mm. So, you know, when I leave, I meet people. Everyone who I've met who's in this, it's been on the road. Yeah. I've met none of them at, at home. home. Yeah. And so to me, it's like, well, that's the, I don't know, is that the case study? Is that, or is that just my circumstances? Well, then the question but is, if you had... Okay, you had two months and people are like, hey, do you want to go to L.A. and you can sell your project idea? Or do you want to go take the risk of two months on the road? What are you going to choose? Two months on the road, probably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I find that super is... hard because people have offered like, hey, just come stay with me for a little bit and you can, you can figure out how to sell this here. And I'm like, is that... That doesn't sound like me. Yeah. 
is that what I need to do that I need to conform, you know? Yeah. And it's not working for a lot of people there too. No. You know, it, it is working for some and maybe you meet them and you, you know, you collaborate and you get better and that's how you improve your craft. And I think that's for sure the case is just creating with other people, getting other ideas and getting, you know, pushing yourself. But not everyone there's making it. So, you know, the one thing I do know is your product is really good. And so I like, after I saw it, I'm like, holy, this is oh, thanks, man. amazing. Like, this is so good. Way more than I expected. And I was just like, dude, this is very professional. This is like ready to go now. Mm-hmm. It seemed like. And I, without knowing you, I would be super interested in it. Mm-hmm. And I know you, so I, I'm obviously very interested in it, but it's like you have the product in my mind. It's like you have it. I fully believe that like if people would, could see it, it could get in front of people, it would be, it would be bought. Mm-hmm. It's just like, how do you do that? And that's like the stressful thing is when you have the talent and you have the product, but you can't get it to the right person. Yeah. Well, and then people will say, I'm sure maybe they'll comment on this, but it's like, oh, but you have YouTube, you're able to do it this way. You know, it's a new generation. And yeah, that's very true. But then how do you beat the algorithms Mm -hmm. to be number one? Yeah. You don't have to be number one, but how do you get the most eyeballs on it or people who are interested in it? It's yeah. not the most pe. You don't ever need the most people. It's just people who are interested in it. Mm-hmm. And I find it interesting. This is kind of a side thing, but a lot of famous YouTubers right now and uh, people that are in the spotlight, I find it interesting because they're going to travel right now. Like, yeah, a lot of famous people are traveling around and vlogging and documenting it, and. What I think is interesting about that, though, is they're still not doing it in the way that we're doing it, in the backpacking way. Mm -hmm. Because... They have money. (laughs) they they, They have money, but also maybe it's because they have a fame and notoriety. But I don't even know if they think about doing it that way. It's just like not... It's not what people... Um... It's just a certain mindset. Well, there's some people like... Especially in America, it is a, you know... They demonize ever, all this stuff in the sense of they make it scary. There's the movie Hostel. You stay in hostel. You stay in <laughs> yeah, hostels. Yeah. I'm like what? yeah, they're awesome. No way. Like, have you seen the movie Hostel? No, I haven't. No. Like it's scary. I'm like cool. Yeah, that's a movie. It's a horror movie. Yeah, right. Like it's not what it is. Yeah. Um. Oh, I was gonna go. Um, but you were talking about um. Sorry, I, I, no, I, no, 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 you go, 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 go. <laughs> Tell me what you, I was talking about because I can't You were remember. talking about how, uh, we were talking about with the algorithm with YouTube, right? Oh, yeah. So I know like the, the new thing that a lot of comedians are doing is they're releasing their specials for free on YouTube with a donation thing on there. Uh-huh. And the reason it works for them is because they expect the money to come back. They're going to, so many more people are going to see it, which means they're going to book they're going to pay for tickets to come see their stand-up. And so for them, it makes sense because they have this traveling. Now you play shows and that's, I would almost say that's, I don't know. You ask, you tell me how much of this show is like the travel and like storyline of it. And then how much of it is the music? Like the music's great. Like I've heard you play. I'm going to hear you live for the first time tonight and second time. Heard band practice last night. Yeah, but and that uh, one time in Lincoln. Oh yeah, that one time Husker in Lincoln. <laughs> that one, I think I came after the show was oh, over. Though. Okay, we had just I didn't get to hear you. Know. But uh, do you think that could be a way to release it with a donation thing, and then maybe hope like put together a traveling gig like thing my, where people can pay to see you, and maybe like you like you were saying, you had this idea, and I don't know if you want to say it. Yeah, I mean, what I, what my hope for what what my dream is actually for the show is the show is released and it, if it goes somewhere on a platform that would be amazing and if it doesn't then i release it in a way 
either behind a paywall, and, and then this is another question, right? Do you release it behind a paywall or do you release it just free on YouTube and do a donation thing? But that's not the end goal, right? Because then that's out, people watch it. Oh, that's great. Well, what is Kevin doing now? I would love to take it on the road with a live show with an immersive lecture slash film slash music experience where people really get to, they get to ask questions, they get to laugh, they get to maybe cry. <laughs> <laughs> they get to experience all the motions of traveling, but also get to hear the music behind it. Because it is more than just writing music. And also with the writing music, I try to put in my experiences. But like you said, you don't listen to lyrics. So how are you going to get the story? But that's just me and I might just be dumb. Uh, but that there's a bunch of friends that I have who don't listen to lyrics. They're like, oh yeah, it was a great song. and I'll, but, but I don't really know what you're talking about because I don't listen. Yeah, I don't hear. Like, yeah, it's like I don't hear it. I but hear if I was music, to tell you afterwards, yeah. the reason I wrote this, like the lyrics that I use, the, the story that I'm telling is this, maybe you would listen a little bit mm -hmm. more intently. Yeah, for sure. Or you would get an insight into the process and the song would means something more to you afterwards. Yeah. And so I, I do think the live shows are, I'm really excited about them. Yeah. Like I'm really excited to, to bring that all together. Cool. Um, I, just an idea like spitballing here. I'm thinking about this. Like remember MTV unplugged, uh -huh. they play a song, they talk, play yeah. a song, they talk. Yeah. And then there's this guy, uh, we were talking about him a little bit, Henry Rollins, who's this played for, uh, Black oh flag. God. Black flag, yeah. And then he does spoken word where he just talks. Oh. He tells experiences. When he, he tells, goes and tells, he tells, tells travel about, stories. That's all he right. does. He doesn't play music. He just tells travel stories. He talks he's, about what he's learned throughout his travels because he's traveled all over the place. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's something like that. You do this spoken word with music. You tell some stories. You take in some questions in between, you know, the songs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, I wrote this song in Antarctica and here's the story behind this thing or that thing. We put in, you know, this sound effect or whatever for this thing because this was there or whatever. And then you play the song and then people are listening way more right. intent because it's like building up to the song. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a super cool experience because it's not just the music. It's the story behind everything and everyone just wants the story. Right. They're just, that's what they're interested in. Right. So, and you know, they do that a lot in, in Nashville. That's okay. like a city where you can go to like a listening room and people tell you about the song, but they don't have, um, Travis, we're, do, we're on, we're we doing a podcast. The... We're filming right now. Um, <laughs> you gotta be quiet. Okay. Oh, you're good. Um, Anyway, uh, so they do that in Nashville where they'll, they'll have a writer's round, it's called, and people will tell the story behind the song. But this is more than that because, like you said, the, the, the sound choices, the, the, the structure of the production of the song, and then on top of that is like, well, what was the story that led to that? And then also what happened that day? Mm -hmm. And who are these people that you wrote with? You can There's show so a, much more in depth. And you can show a like two-minute trailer of each episode. Yeah. To intro you talking to then intro the song. Mm -hmm. Like that would be a super cool way. And I don't know if, you know, you release, you know, maybe some people it's their first time being there. Maybe some people love the, dude, my favorite episode shows I watch eight times over, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not really? like. Really? You'll watch a show eight times? You know, if it's like something I really like, uh -huh. like Tales by Light. Have you ever seen that? No. Oh, dude, it's like my favorite show. It's where they just take, they follow these really, uh niche photographers one mm -hmm. of them is about like world like uh ch underprivileged children it's oh. like child labor and that's okay. what he shoots and they follow him around the show follows him around and he's like in bolivia shooting kids who are digging in coal mines he goes to uh like india where they're working balloon factories at like six, six years old whoa and that's his niche and the next one is like endangered species where um he follows like this guy shoots anacondas and he dives down and finds anacondas and takes pictures of them. These gorgeous pictures. Whoa. But they, the whole show is following this photographer. I've seen that show. There's three seasons. I've seen that so many times. It's so cool. And I'm like, Oh, I just, and if that, any of those photographers went and did like a speech, I would, you would be down to go hundred oh, percent. Yeah. And so I think that would be, I don't know. Maybe that's an Avenue. Yeah. Maybe that's the whole, 
maybe that's the whole answer to the question that, that I'm asking of how to, you know, complete the funding or, or get a return from yeah. what I've invested made that it's not even about, I mean, it's about the show, mm-hmm. but it's so much more than that because it's live and I can talk to the people and then they want to go see the show. Yep. And maybe they saw the show and they just want to see you. Mm-hmm. No one's watching Ariana Grande for the first time when they go to an Ariana Grande concert. You know what I'm right. saying? Like they like them. Right. They like what they've done or whatever that is. So um, I I was also thinking, oh man, I just might have lost what I was thinking about. Oh, darn it. The Ari- Ariana Grande got me. I forget what it was. <laughs> I was like, thanks for the comparison. Oh, oh here's what it is. Here's what it is. Oh, um, thanks. The cool thing about like YouTube and social media is you can put money behind it. So because your product is really good, you don't, as soon as the trailer is done and put in front of people and it's done very well, it's going to speak for itself. They just got to see it. Right. So it's, it's, I think your issue right now is it's not getting in front of enough people mm-hmm. or it's not in front of anyone. Well, yet. I haven't, I haven't yeah, gotten in front of, I mean, this is of, the first time I've talked about it on a podcast. Yeah, exactly. So this is the, it is, it will just need to get in front of people. So at least you can pay to get it in front of people that way. That's true. So that could be, and I don't know, I'm literally just thinking of this stuff right now, but maybe that's the route where you have the donation. And again, I think explore all the options of it, Mm -hmm. but that's like the, because it's good. And the issue is not the quality. The issue is the connections, maybe that who knows, maybe that's the way. I don't know. We don't got to yeah, talk strategy true. on this podcast the whole time, no. but that's kind of what <laughs> no, it is. No, like no. I'm curious as no, to I think that's... how to do this because I have my own, you know, like goals and, and ideas that I want to do. And so I'm just trying to learn from you and yeah, I can learn so much and I already have, but I can learn and vice versa. Yeah. And it, well, it's just like a cool way to try to figure these problems out with someone mm-hmm. of like, yeah, I, I understand. I don't know exactly what you're going through, but I can imagine. Well, you're going through the same thing because you, you want to go, shoot first of all at the world cup yeah and then you also i mean you have an idea of of kind of doing the same uh format should we say yeah 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 but in a different genre yeah for sure not music you but but you've like done it so you're like years ahead of me already which is but it's a great you know thing for me to look at and Mm -hmm. then if i can even you know try to if I assist you in any way in just thinking about what to do, it's like, I'm going to have these same conversations with myself, you know, when I get to that point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just think I'm like in on trying to figure out how you can get this because it's like, I totally believe in from what I've seen. It's so good that like, I can't (laughs) wait to see the episodes, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just pumped about it. Yeah. And and it's hard because everybody has a different, answer right and and like when we were talking about la and new york like people telling you to go there they don't know it's just like they that's just what they did Mm -hmm. or that's what they're hoping by being there or that's what they've heard to do and everyone has a different path i mean what's crazy about this specific industry of like entertaining people through through film or music is there's not like a, a a perfect path that you need to take, you know, if you want to go be a, and eng- I don't know, a nuclear engineer, it's like, you go to school, you do this, mm-hmm. you, you get this entry level job, you work your way up, then you're, you're in charge of the, actually, I don't know how to be a nuclear engineer, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. I don't know why I chose that, but, but you, you know, like there's jobs where it's like, well, you work here, then you move up to this, then you do this. Like mm-hmm. in, in, in this industry, it's like, what is the next step? Mm-hmm. People just think, oh, you have to go to Hollywood because that's what you got to do. Yeah. Well, why? It's like, well, that's where it's happening. Well, why? Why is that where it's happening mm-hmm. now? And also, are the is it burnt out there? Is it? Have they been doing it so long that they? It's not artistic anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not like, you know, it's not. <laughs> what do I want to say? It's not like interesting art. Yeah. I mean, would I say it like that? It's not. It's not something new and fresh. Like what? It, what's happening in Cape Town, South Africa, may be way more interesting than what's taking place in LA right now. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, and just a thought of like in the in the world of social media, it gives that it levels the playing field. 
Yeah. And maybe that's the root. And, you know, but what's the blueprint for social media? Like, you just don't then know. Then it's a totally different game, right? You're not- for sure. And I think, I think number one, most important thing is it has to be quality mm-hmm. work, which is what you have. And so that's why I think having like harsh criticism, which is I, something I always welcome. Like I always want people to be tough on what I'm doing because it's like, that's the only way it's, you're going to make anywhere is if it's really good. So if it's right. not good, you got to tell me now because right. I have to change it then. Right. You know, and you can always get better as long as you just never give up. And I think that's the first step. Just never give up mm-hmm. and then just keep going. And eventually something will probably yeah, I think, come of all of it. I think that you're right. It, you, you always do want criticism. I always actually enjoy criticism about my music or about my editing style or about what we filmed. Because one, you'll, you'll find out if the things that you think are, are really shocking and cringy and, and not the best quality, you'll find out if they even pick up on that. Because a lot of times mm-hmm. the things that you think are bad are not actually what anybody notices. <clears throat> yeah. And then people will point out stuff and you can either be like, oh yeah, I did need to change that. Or you can say like, you don't really get it. Like that's my style. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. Yeah. And I, I appreciate your input, but it's not yeah. going to change how I do it. And so it's good because I think it makes you stronger in what you want to create. And what you believe. Any getting tested in any way is good because it's like you it makes you stronger about what who you are and what you want to create, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. I think so many times when you're shooting, like you think about that, like over the last two days, us shooting. Like, do you want it like this? Do you want it like that? And it's like, okay, yeah, but you're holding the camera, Drew. I kind of want to how you you picture it. Mm-hmm. Because I do have my own style, but I'm not holding the camera right now. Because yeah. I would hold it different. Yeah. You know? And then it's like, okay, but when I go to edit, I'm like, oh, all right, he had this style. How do I take what I imagined? And and that's the cool part. I, I love being like holding the camera mm-hmm. and then like directing's awesome too. Yeah. But then like when you're holding the camera, you also feel like the director, you know, because especially we're not on a Hollywood movie set. Yeah. It's not like I'm coming to check to see if you have the perfect shot. I'm trusting yeah. that you have the shot. Yeah. And you also don't want to take that away from people too. Like when you have your crew together, like let people explore their craft as well. And then, and then make sure to check on it and say, Hey, this isn't really what I was thinking. And this isn't really good. And maybe they'll learn something too. Yeah. And if they can tell you why it's good, that's even better. Cause then you're like, Oh, all right. Well you defended it. Now I know where you're coming from. And actually, yeah, I guess I could get an idea. From yeah. That. Yeah, for sure. That is like seeing other people's, even if like seeing other people's perspective on and just their creativity of what they come up with is like, I just, that's like a drug I'm where I'm like, I just love to see it. I'm like, oh, I never thought of it like that. Mm-hmm. I remember I was in Taiwan and I met up with this photographer and th- I hadn't been doing photography very long. Like I'd been mostly doing video. And we went out and we shot and he had took some like really cool photos of me. And I'm like, I would never in my life have thought of taking that picture ever. And since I like learned so much from just that, seeing Mm -hmm. that, I'm like, what are you doing? And then he took it. I'm like, oh my gosh. I look so cool. That is so (laughs) cool. I was like, oh, and then, oh, why did he, what did he do? What were the elements in that? Uh And I just got from that point, I learned some really cool things right then. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, you saw this so different than I did, this whole scene. And then I just learned from right there. And I was like, oh, this is such a cool like experience. Like I don't think he learned anything from me, <laughs> but I learned a lot from him and I thought it was so awesome. Yeah. So um but you gotta be out there meeting those people. Yeah. And yeah. That's and and the I, I, there's also like a level of like seriousness too. You want to lurk with people who are serious about whatever their craft is. And I think that that's so important. Like anybody thinking about getting into whatever it is you're going to get into, like make sure you do it and you, you learn and you, and pursue it if that's what you want to do. Because 
so many people are like, yeah, I want to, I want, we'll use music as an example. Yeah, I really want to start songwriting. Like, well, what are you waiting for to start? Oh, I'm waiting to, uh, when I, once I get out of college, oh, I'm waiting for uh, the end of the summer and then I can settle down. It's like, no, like today's the day. And if you don't do it today, if you don't write a crappy song today, Mm -hmm. you're not going to get to the great songs. Yep. You know, that's what I've learned. It's like, oh, well, that, that wasn't the best footage I have, so I don't want to edit it. Uh, let, let, let's shoot again. It's like, no, editing the footage that you have shows you what was wrong with the way you shot it. Yep. If you're going to do it, then, then bring it to completion, even if it's bad. You know, if you're going to write the song, write the song and complete the song. If you're going to produce the song, produce the song even if you don't get the mix right. If you're going to make the video, if you're going to shoot the video, then edit the video. Mm-hmm. So you know what you did wrong with the shooting. Yep. And when you show someone the edit, they'll point out what's wrong. And the interesting part is they might point out your editing, something you edited was wrong, or they'll point out something that you shot was wrong, or they'll point out the sound was wrong. Like mm-hmm. You need to have a baseline. You need to create in order for there to be criticism so you can get better. But if you always just think, oh, I, I'm just going to do that amazing project. Yeah. I'm just going to go do on seven and I'm not going to have tried anything else. Mm-hmm. Like how would I, how would I complete that? How would I know what to do? Yeah. It's failing forward. Mm-hmm. And it's something that we don't teach people. It's like, you're going to fail. It's going to be bad, Yeah, but it will be better and it will get better. And at least you did it. Yeah. Oh, does that mean the podcast is does over? Does that mean the podcast is over? We can start <laughs> wrapping this up. and We got to get to yeah, he's a got live a show. show. He's got a show tonight. playing in a little bit. So, um, yeah, let's wrap this up. You got a song coming out. Got a song coming Dropping out. Dropping today. Today. The day this podcast is coming yeah, out. The song's song called coming. Call Me When You're Done. Okay. And, uh, yeah, then there's going to be a music video as well. Um, I'm excited about this song. It's a little bit different than than my other stuff. It's uh, it leans into more of a poppy kind of '80s feel, which I haven't played around with. But there's, you know, it's still 100% me. So cool. Yeah, I'm pumped. I haven't heard it yet. Have I? No. Are you playing it tonight? I'll play it tonight. Okay, sweet. So we'll get to hear it tonight <laughs> at the show. Um, where can people find all your stuff on set you can, and everything? You can find it out on Kevin Kennedy the third. That that's everywhere. So it's Kevin Kennedy I I I. That's Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, <laughs> whatever, yeah. whatever it is you want to find me on. Uh, it's under Kevin Kennedy the third, and on seven is on seven show.com. Uh, the trailer will be coming out soon and yeah, you can also follow on seven on Instagram as well. I'll link all those things below. We didn't even get to it. Your clothing line. Oh, and one on to you. One on to so check it yeah. out. That's a one on to all handmade products from the YU people in Columbia. Yeah. Sick. He showed me Pocketed, some of his shirts. Some he's got the shirt on. He, yeah. He's gonna. He said he could. I could get a shirt. Bags, yeah, guitar gonna, straps, dog collars. I'm gonna snag a shirt. I'll probably yeah. maybe take it on my next travels. Yeah, tag get you guys in it. But uh, yeah, check that out. Um, I'll again. I'll link all of that in the show notes and whatever platform you're watching this on or listening to this on, and uh, I'll link all of my stuff as well. Uh, stay tuned to him to me. Wait for this trailer. You guys are gonna be blown away. It's so sick. Thanks for thanks for yeah, letting me. Thanks for having me. Oh, hosting you. If you want to hear the music too, I didn't say that part. Oh, but yeah. Kevin Kenny the Third is on all streaming platforms. Spotify. I got Spotify, a few of his songs Pandora, on my sorry. Amazon Music. Amazon. Yeah, do the whole. You got a few sorry, with it. I messed it up. No, all all the platforms. You know. All the platforms. I have a few of his songs on my Mary Sue Swimming Hole Country playlist. I feel so honored to hear that. Yeah, it's, there's <laughs> a lot of, it's it's good stuff. It's good for like drinking late night beers in like Mexico and you're just oh, chilling okay. with people. Okay. That's the playlist okay. and I got a bunch good. of your stuff on there. So, all right, cool. Thanks for uh, tuning in everybody. Thanks for letting me do this in your house. Oh, my no, first th- podcast th- in a long time. Thanks for coming, man. And thanks for um, shooting 
content with me and thanks for having me on your podcast. Dude, it's been so much fun the last two days. It's been awesome, and I'm, man. And I'm really excited to see where your journey takes you. And I, I know we're probably going to work on some projects in the future together. Sure. So Awesome, man. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening. Thanks again, Kevin. And uh, see you guys next time.